All right, friends and neighbors, I was a little bored and I thought I'd, you know, make another networking video. And the subject I've chosen is MPLS. Now, before we get started into MPLS operation, let's do a little virtual circuit example. Now, let's say that we've got traffic flowing from B to A over there. Now, the virtual circuit is the entire link between that source and destination. And so if we look at switch number three, we've got an incoming virtual circuit identifier of 77. Now, for those of you purists out there, you probably said, well, wait a minute, this looks a lot like an ATM circuit, and it probably is, but that's completely immaterial because what we're trying to get in our heads is how virtual circuit operates because that's what MPLS tags do. They define a virtual circuit or a virtual switched path along the way. That's a combination of the labels. So that's why we're looking at this here. So we see that VCI 77 is incoming on port three and switch three knows that the destination is over there at A. And so what we also know is how to get to A. And we'll see how that works in a little bit because remember that the virtual circuit in this case has been set up already. And we're gonna see that MPLS tags are very often set up long before we want traffic to flow. So VCI 77 incoming on port three maps to VCI 22 outgoing on port two. It goes down to switch two and switch two receives VCI 22 on its incoming port two and knows that that's mapped to 66 outgoing on port one. Now, what we have to realize is that this is just an example. There could be 50,000, not really, but there could be a whole bunch of tags incoming on switch two on that same link but going to different destinations. And that's why the outgoing port makes a difference because when we're um, trying to map VCI to VCI in this case, the critical idea is that it's the entire virtual circuit. And so if we're going to different destinations, we're mapping VCI and incoming port and VCI and outgoing port. So we gotta make sure we keep track of those. So then 66 goes up to port to, or to switch one, incoming on port three, and then the outgoing VCI is 14. Now the exact, in this case, we could map it back the other way too, but uh, that's not always the case. So that's an example of a virtual circuit. It's the combination of incoming and outgoing ports and incoming and outgoing VCIs. Now just as a reminder, MPLS is often called layer 2.5 tech. It is connection oriented in the sense that we know where the source and destinations are as far as routed destinations or destination networks and we're going to make tags that map to those destination networks. And what we're going to do is we're not going to process things at layer three except on the ingress to our cloud and at the egress to our cloud. Everything else in between is going to be switched or forwarded based on the MPLS tag. So when you're coming in, a lot of times we make layer two decisions. And then once we get off of our local area network, we push things up to layer three routing, but that's where things tend to slow down. And so this is down there at layer 2.5 because we've inserted that MPLS shim. Now the source to destination is something called a label switched path. And a lot of times they're established between all sources and all destinations prior to traffic being forwarded, but they also can be sort of um, reactive in the sense that the minute a demand is made, then we'll set up the path. So here's a couple of our big MPLS ideas. We have to create the labels and then we have to spread them around. Now this is after we usually set up the routing. Then we've got to set up the tables. We've got to build a table with all the labels in there and then match the labels to a network destination or a routed address. Then we establish the label switch paths between the source and destination. And then going back the other way, that's a different label switch path. Remember that flows are unidirectional. Once we want to send traffic, we're going to insert that tag do the uh, the uh, table lookup to decide how we're going to forward it and then engage in packet forwarding. So here's a sample MPLS topology. Now we'll revisit this after we get some terms out of the way, but here's our first look at it. 
And if we imagine that we've got traffic flowing from R1 to R6, what happens at the ingress of our MPLS cloud is we make our routing decision. And we say, okay, based on where you're going, we're going to start labeling your traffic with particular layer 2.5 labels or tags. Now, the, the router that first does that in an MPLS cloud is called the label edge router. All of the routers along the pathway are called label switched routers. And of course, the entire path is the label switch path. And then at the outgoing side of the cloud, the egress, we call that a label edge router as well. And I've got a little pop right there because that last tag is popped off of the label stack. And of course, we're left just with the original datagrams at that point. We don't have any more MPLS stuff inserted. And again, we can see the incoming and outgoing tags. We see that we start with 89. That goes into R3 on... Uh, it's incoming port and 89 gets mapped to 22 and then 22 gets mapped to 41 and 41 gets mapped to no tag after that because the last tag is popped. So let's remind ourselves about our terminology. We've got our label switch path. It is the virtual circuit from source to destination, the collection of labels from source to destination. And then going back the other way, we would have a different label switch path, even though it's theoretically possible that you could use the exact same tags. Label switch paths are determined prior to data transmissions. Now they can be set up when you need them or they can be pre-set up. We also have the reverse entry as we just said. Upstream and downstream are defined by a destination relative to the network point in question. So if your data, if you're thinking about data flow, data flows upstream to downstream, kind of like, well, water. Now the labels, are assigned at the label edge router at the ingress that's our last routing decision and then we forward everything based on the labels at layer 2.5 and at the egress they're popped now you may have the same label throughout so for example if you're going to a destination it's possible that all of the routers might actually use the same destination tag as was used before so in the example that we'll see here later on the tag 16 so all of the routers might identify tag 16 as belonging to a particular network de destination or they can choose to remap all of the tags but the key is that the incoming tag is mapped to an outgoing port and another tag at the egress of the mpls network of course they're they're all removed and we don't have any more tags now, one of the ways that we commonly see tags sprinkled around the network is via something called a label distribution protocol. And so we have the ability to manually configure them, do a little bit of engineering, or you can just say, well, listen, all the routers know where the router destinations are via some routing protocol. Let's implement a label distribution protocol and let them automatically figure out where all the tags are gonna, are gonna be or what all the and let them automatically figure out where all the tags are going to be for all the destination networks. We know now that a label switched router is one of the high speed routers. It's just forwarding things based on the tags. It's not worrying about adding the tags. It's not worrying about removing the last tags. It's just worried about, all right, what tag do I have coming in? What tag is it supposed to be going out? It's usually at the center of the cloud. So it's not at an ingress or an egress point. All the router has to do is look up its label table to see what that mapping is supposed to be. The label edge routers, those are the ones at the ingress and the egress to the cloud. Those are the ones that either start the tagging process or end the agging, uh, or, or end the tagging process. And here's just another look at our MPLS topology. Now that we've got the terminology out of the way, we can see that router number two and router number five are both label edge router and it doesn't matter what direction the traffic is flowing in because we've defined the boundary of our MPLS cloud. Now the topology could be much more complex inside the MPLS cloud it doesn't really matter but we also know that R3 and R4 are label switched routers they don't know anything about routing at layer 3 they're just forwarding things based on the layer 2.5 MPLS tag and of course the entire thing from R1 to R6, those source and destination networks, that's the label switched path through the MPLS cloud. Okay, let's say that you have an OSPF 
built topology or you got a BGP network so all of the routers know where all the destinations are. So we know that a routing protocol's job is to find all of the destinations and do things like eliminate loops uh, to find the most efficient pathway to the destination, maybe do some load balancing. So these are all things that a routing protocol does in addition to finding all the destination networks. And we now know how MPLS works, right? MPLS has the label switch path, forward thing, forwards things based on the label. But how do we tie the two together? Well, the magic is in RFC 5036, the label distribution protocol. In addition to this RFC, we have ways to get the labels around. As I said earlier, you can manually configure them, you can do some engineering, but the one of the basic ideas in MPLS is that we have to tell the routers what the labels are for the destination network so that we can do the forwarding, right? So a fundamental concept in MPLS is that two label switching routers must agree on the meaning of labels in order to forward traffic between them. And so that's what the label distribution protocol is going to do. It's going to the routers are going to communicate via messaging to say, hey, these labels go with these destination networks. Now, the forward equivalence class is the handling that all packets going along the label switch path are going to have or be uh, organized by. So if you're going to use the label distribution protocol to sprinkle the labels around the network, then what happens is you turn on the label distribution protocol and then the routers start communicating. Once the messages are swapped between the routers, then the routers start to build a table of bindings for the destination networks and the labels that have been distributed. So the example on the bottom here is that we can see with the show MPLS forwarding table that tags 16, 17, and 18 are tied to particular destination networks and there's an outgoing interface associated with them. And we also see that we've got interfaces that are using the label distribution protocol as defined by RFC 5036. Now here's the general message type that all label distribution protocols use. There are a couple of different messages that are part of the label distribution protocol. It's pretty straightforward, right? We have discovery and then we're going to establish a connection between the routers and then they're going to advertise the labels to each other. On the bottom we have a couple of LDP messages that are swapped between the routers that are 3.254 and 4.254. Here is an example of a label mapping message. The part that I've highlighted here is the actual tag 16 that we saw in the table from the previous slide. Now that doesn't actually look like a 16, does it? It looks like a 2. But we have to remember that a lot of these fields are swapped in their order, right? So we have to remember Big Endian and Little Endian in, as far as the direction here. And so this is an example of a field that is uh, swapped from the way that we would normally think of reading it. All right, here's a little closer look at our MPLS IP bindings. We have the different networks listed on the left and the incoming and outgoing labels for the various destinations. Now we can also see that in a lot of cases we're using the same tags. So in this particular case, there wasn't a whole lot of changing of tag values between the input ports and the outgoing ports. And here we have just some of the output from the system showing some of the parameters available with LDP. You can see that there's quite a bit to configure. And like many protocols, there's a hold time for the information. There's a hello time messaging. That was actually kind of interesting. It looks like we got a typo in the Cisco output of the system. Now the last big idea that I want to leave you with today is the forward equivalence class. Now it's easy to think of this as a priority or a precedence sort of thing. That's not, I mean that's part of it, but that's not really the main thing. The main thing about the forward equivalence class is it's an identification of the handling or the requirements for a particular group of packets. So a representation of a group of packets that share the same requirements for transport. Now that may or may not be priority handling. But really what we're talking about here is a flow of packets. And the FEC assignment occurs as the packets go into the network in the same way that the tag is because the FEC is actually part of the tag. Now it might be that we have priority handling there. Might be. Packets entering the MPLS cloud are examined for FEC match 
and then the subsequent routers just forward things based on the label because again it's part of the label. How we configure the FEC is very similar to the way that we did DSPs and the mapping between costs before. We have a policy or a configuration of some kind that tells us what we want our forward equivalence class to be. Here are a couple of examples of MPLS tag traffic. Now there's a couple of things that I want to look at on this particular slide. We'll start with the upper box there where it says type MPLS label switch packet. Now this is really easy to gloss over but I want to pause here and remind us what this particular field does. If we're not doing anything, we're just looking at regular traffic and we are forwarding IP version 4 packets in an Ethernet frame. That particular type field will be 0800. If it's ARP, it'll be 0806. So this tells us what we're carrying. Most of the time, you're going to see 0800 there for Ethernet type 2 traffic. When we did 802.1Q, we saw that that changed to 8100. And the reason it changed to 8100 is because all of a sudden we were inserting the .1Q header. Well, here again, we are inserting the header. So it's not really just straight up IP packets carrying ICMP. It's Ethernet with MPLS carrying IP carrying ICMP. And so now that type field is 8847. So that's an important thing to remember. We can see that this upper packet, it's going from 5.1 to 1.1, and the MPLS label for that particular transmission in that particular direction is 18. And then we can see the, the arrow is pointing to the addressing that we're using. Now at the bottom, the packet is going back the other way. It's going from 1.1 to 5.1, and the MPLS label there is 16 because this particular router has identified that that particular destination should be tagged with 16. So important details to remember about our tag traffic. Well, thanks very much for watching. Thanks for listening. This has been a little taste of MPLS operation, and we got to look at some tag traffic. Like and subscribe if I helped, and until next time, may your packets always reach their destinations.